Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Talia Marcajani, and these are the five key nutrients for depression. When it comes to improving mood, most of us will do anything, um, including taking boatloads of pills. Um, and one of the challenges I face as a naturopathic doctor is choosing which supplements to prescribe my patients. Um, in the realm of natural medicine, we have what seems like an infinite amount of options. I can prescribe herbs for regulating the stress response, for calming inflammation, or zenning out the brain. I can prescribe amino acids like 5-HTP, which help regulate chemicals in the brain. I can recommend the hottest new products like collagen or greens powder or the newest superfood. There are also a host of nutrients that the brain and body need for optimal functioning. But I like to try to keep my list of supplement recommendations to a maximum of five things, give or take, depending on the patient, uh, letting diet and lifestyle do the rest of the heavy lifting. And this means I tend to work in layers, like an onion. When I see a new patient, I start by prescribing nutrients that fill in nutritional gaps, um, letting the body start to do its own work and heal itself. Um, so perhaps my patients are showing signs of deficiency based on their health histories, their diet diaries, or blood results, or perhaps they just need a bit more support in the face of physical, mental, emotional, and environmental stressors. After they start to notice improvement, we might move on to clearing more of the layers, so using herbs or therapies like acupuncture or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Naturopathic medicine doesn't believe in a one-size-fits-all uh, treatment. If I see two patients with depression on the same day, for example, both may receive entirely different plans, and I base my recommendations on the person and their unique biography and biology, not on the condition. However, because I try to keep my supplement suggestions to a minimum when I work with patients with depression, I find that these five nutrients continue to show up on my treatment plan list. So the first one, I have signs, is fish oil. While most antidepressant therapies target the brain, we know that depression isn't simply a brain disorder. So depression is a complex condition impacted by our genes, our physical health, our social and physical environments, early childhood traumas, current stressors, nutrient status, and many other factors. Our minds and bodies are connected and therefore depression is as much a product of our health, of the health of our bodies and our environments as it is of our brains. Mounting evidence shows that inflammation in the body plays a major role in depression. Since the 90s, scientists have found inflammatory cytokines, which are immune system molecules that can cause inflammation, like IL-6 and TNF-alpha, are elevated in depressed individuals. When pro-inflammatory substances like lycopolysaccharide, or LPS, or a drug called interferon alpha, uh, which is traditionally used to treat hepatitis C, are injected into healthy individuals, they can cause symptoms of depression, um, like lack of motivation and pleasure and feelings of sadness. Anti-inflammatory substances are also effective antidepressants. So the omega-3 fatty acid, eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, found in fatty fish like salmon and sardines, is a well-known anti-inflammatory nutrient. One study found that supplementing with EPA prevented depressive symptoms in individuals who were injected with interferon alpha, which remember can cause depression because it increases inflammation. Fish oil contains the omega-3 fatty acids EPA and, let me try and pronounce this, docosahexanoic acid or DHA. Both of these marine omegas are found in certain fatty fish, which we can remember by the acronym SMASH. So sardines, mackerel, anchovy, salmon, and herring, and also trout. Fish oil supplements contain EPA and DHA. You could look on the ingredient list to see how much of each is contained within your fish oil. DHA is a component of our brain mass. It's needed for developing brains and nervous systems, and um, therefore it's, it's indicated for pregnant and breastfeeding women to support the brains of their, of their babies. EPA is what confers the anti-inflammatory benefit. A meta-analysis, which is a composition of different randomized control trials or medical studies, of 15 randomized control trials involving almost 1,000 participants found that fish oil was an effective therapy for treating depression as long as the fish oil contained over 60% EPA. So 60% of the fatty acids had to be from EPA and 40% or less had to come from DHA. Another review composing, composed of three different studies showed that omega-3 fish oil supplementation reduced depressive symptoms in children and adults by 50%. And so when it comes to supplementing fish oil for depression, it's the EPA that counts, not the DHA. 
Also, more fish oil seems to be better than less. Studies that showed the best antidepressant of actions dose participants with at least a gram of EPA per day. Some studies gave patients two grams of EPA or more per day. And supplements that showed the most benefit contain higher amounts of EPA relative to DHA. If you can get this, can you get this from food? A hundred gram serving of wild Atlantic salmon contains about 400 milligrams of EPA. While farmed Atlantic salmon surprisingly contains more, 700 milligrams of EPA per 100 grams, probably comes from the feed that they're given. While consuming fatty fish like sardines and pasture raised rather than grain fed animals can increase our dietary ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids, which has general health benefits, supplementation with a high EPA fish oil is probably necessary to supply the one to two grams of EPA that have been shown to reduce depression. Number two is an active B complex. So B vitamins are cofactors for thousands of reactions in the body. Cofactors are helpers. They help enzymes and cellular processes in the body work. Without these helpers, important jobs just won't get done. This can have major implications for our mental health. For example, the vitamins B6 and folate are needed to convert the amino acids tryptophan to 5-HTP to serotonin, which is the happy hormone. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter responsible for managing mood, for soothing depression and anxiety, and regulating our appetite, our memory, and our sexual desire. Serotonin is the main target of conventional antidepressant therapies. The SSRI, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor medications, which are thought to raise brain levels of this chemical and improve mood. Both B12, which is important for energy production and neuronal health, and folate, which is important for DNA repair, detoxification, and reducing inflammation, have been found to be low in patients with depression. And a B12 deficiency, which results in fatigue, memory loss, and low mood, can also mimic the symptoms of depression. It's important to supplement with an active form of the B vitamins. This means buying and consuming a B complex or multivitamin that contains B12 and folate in their active forms. And the active forms are methylcobalamin and methylfolate, or 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, or 5-MTHF, respectively. Okay, so the active form of B12 is methylcobalamin. The active form of folate is 5-MTHF. Individuals who have a genetic mutation that prevents them from efficiently converting folic acid, which is a synthetic vitamin found in sheep supplements and fortified grains like wheat and rice, to active folate, are highly represented in the major depressive disorder population. This gene is called MTHFR-C677T. You don't need to remember that, you can just remember it as MTHFR, and is associated with lower blood levels of folate and increased risk of depression. And to learn more about folic acid and MTHFR mutations, um, I'll post a link to my article that I wrote about it. B vitamins are also needed by the mitochondria, as, which are the powerhouses of our cells, by helping the mitochondria work properly, they help reduce inflammation, boost energy production, and promote antioxidant synthesis. And we can get B vitamins from food. They're found highly in egg yolks and in liver. And the only dietary sources of B12 are found in animal foods, which makes it difficult for vegans and vegetarians to get without supplementing. Folate is abundant in our leafy green vegetables like spinach, chard, and kale. Physical, mental, emotional, and environmental stressors can create a high demand for the B vitamins. The B vitamins are also water soluble, and which means that they're excreted in the urine and not stored. Therefore, to support neurotransmitter synthesis and energy levels in my depressed patients, I often prescribe a good quality B complex supplement to complement their diets. Number three is magnesium. I don't know if these are showing backwards, but it looks like it in my camera. So because my clinical focuses are mental health, uh, hormones, and digestion, I prescribe magnesium to virtually every patient that I see. Magnesium is an important nutrient in all of these conditions. Like the B vitamins, magnesium is also a cofactor. It's involved in helping with over 800 chemical processes in the body that simply won't get done without enough magnesium. We need magnesium to make cellular energy in the mitochondria to produce neurotransmitters like serotonin and to repair DNA, among many other jobs. Due to soil in deficiency, low intake, stress, and decreased absorption, it's estimated that about 40 to 60% of North Americans are magnesium deficient. Only 1% of the magnesium in our body is present in blood, and blood levels don't ref 
don't reflect the body's magnesium stores, so testing for deficiency is unreliable. So a lot of my patients will be like, oh, I got my magnesium levels tested, and that doesn't really tell us anything about your tissue levels of magnesium. Magnesium is a potent muscle relaxer, so deficiencies show up wherever muscles are contracted rather than relaxed. So this can include constipation because of poor intestinal motility, muscle aches and pains, so those tight shoulders, um, TMJ, neck pain, low back pain, frequent urination due to contracted bladder muscles, menstrual cramps, and headaches and high blood pressure from constricted blood vessels. Insomnia, anxiety, and the sensitivity to loud noises can also be signs of magnesium deficiency. PMS, insulin resistance, and sugar cravings are all further indications for magnesium supplementation. So because magnesium does so much in the body, signs of deficiency can show up anywhere. And it's not a medicine. When we start prescribing magnesium as a supplement, it will fill in gaps that our body and, and start doing the jobs that our body needs it to do. Magnesium can be obtained from leafy greens like spinach and chard. However, most individuals need to supplement to stock up their magnesium levels, particularly if experiencing stress, fatigue, anxiety, or depression. Like the B vitamins, magnesium is water soluble, excreted in the urine in response to stress. So I personally prescribe magnesium glycinate, which is a well-absorbed form. There are other well-absorbed forms though, but I like glycinate. Um, and I prescribe it before bed because it can help with improving sleep and relaxing muscles before bed. And this means I start with, so I start with 100 to 200 milligrams per night and I tell my patients to increase that every three to four days or until they're having a bowel movement on waking. And this is called prescribing to bowel tolerance. So a side effect of taking too much magnesium is loose stools or soft stools that fall apart in the toilet on flushing, which can be corrected by lowering the dose. So I personally take about 900 milligrams of magnesium at night to manage my stress, mood, energy levels, and muscle tension. And the dose is extremely individual. So I work with people to find what their right dose is. Number four is vitamin D. So about 70 to 90% of North Americans are deficient in vitamin D, which acts like a steroid hormone rather than an actual vitamin and regulates over 1000 genes in the body. Our skin makes vitamin D when it comes into contact with UV, UVB radiation from the sun. And those of us who live in Northern climates with limited sun exposure don't make enough vitamin D and need to supplement, especially during the winter months. So starting right now, guys, it's vitamin D time. Vitamin D is needed to regulate the gene tryptophan hydroxylase 2, which converts the amino acid tryptophan, a component of protein that can only be obtained from diet and is found in foods like turkey and pumpkin seeds, to serotonin in the brain. So it's responsible for helping the brain make serotonin. Low vitamin D concentration has been associated with depression. However, researchers aren't sure if the relationship is causal. So does low vitamin D put someone at risk for developing depression? Or do depressed individuals have low vitamin D levels in their bodies because of some other factor, maybe not getting outside as much, or maybe not consuming enough foods with vitamin D? Studies have failed to show that taking vitamin D supplements impacts de depression directly. So it's not like a medicine that you can take and notice benefit to, de to depression right away. And I also haven't found vitamin D to impact my patients' moods as a solo therapy. It's likely that the nutrients like vitamin D act as part of a network in conjunction with other vitamins and minerals like magnesium, for example. And magnesium is responsible for converting supplemental vitamin D into the active form that's used by the body. So without, if you're magnesium deficient and you take vitamin D, it's not gonna do anything. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin and taking it in chalky tablet form may not raise your levels. Uh, so I prescribe vitamin D3, the active form of the vitamin in drop form. Vitamin D drops are suspended in fats like coconut or flax oil, and that makes them easier for the body to absorb. So whether a case of the chicken or the egg when it comes to vitamin D and mood, we know that supporting vitamin D status is essential for achieving optimal health, managing immune function, reducing inflammation, reducing the risk of osteoporosis because it helps um, calcium get directed into the bones, and regulating mood, giving vitamin D's role in, um, given vitamin D's role in serotonin synthesis. So it is a good thing to supplement with. You wanna make sure that your levels are optimal. The Framingham study, which is a big study in a big population of people, found that patients who had low levels of vitamin D had poor mental functioning and reduced volume of a brain region called the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory formation and mood regulation. Reduced hippocampal volume is a risk factor for and consequence of major depression. 
And there's a sweet spot to obtaining optimal vitamin D levels. Because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin and can be stored by the body, too much vitamin D may be as bad as too little vitamin D. Therefore, I like to measure my patient's blood levels in the fall to determine the right dose for supplementation. 4,000 IUs a day is a good safe dose for most people during the winter months. Number five, the last one is zinc. So zinc is a catalyst for hundreds of enzymes in the brain. Um, and it, it includes enzymes that make serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, all of which are brain chemical targets for antidepressive therapies. So you have your SSRIs, your SNRIs, and your NDRIs, like Wellbutrin. And all of these are first line or conventional antidepressant therapies. There's a major concentration of zinc in the hippocampus, a brain region affected by depression that we mentioned shrinks with low vitamin D status. Studies show that zinc plays a role in supporting neurogenesis, uh, which is the creation of new brain cells, by stimulating something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. BDNF creates new brain cells and boosts mood. Antidepressants may work by increasing brain levels of BDNF, protecting the brain against stress. Plasma zinc concentrations are lower in major depressive disorder, and animal studies also show that depleting zinc can lead to major depression. Zinc supplementation has also been shown to boost mood as a monotherapy. A study of 50 overweight or obese patients were assigned to receive either 30 milligrams of zinc, which is a very conservative low dose, or placebo. After 12 weeks, the group who received zinc experienced a greater reduction in the severity of their depression and an increase in the levels of BDNF in their brains. Uh, zinc is also an important nutrient for supporting the immune system and managing inflammation. And besides depression, other signs of zinc deficiency include skin issues like dry skin and acne, infertility, issues with gut membrane integrity, so the leaky gut or intestinal permeability, hair loss, low testosterone, poor immune function, and fatigue. Di dietary sources of zinc are harder to come by for vegans and vegetarians who are at higher risk for developing a zinc deficiency. Zinc can be found in meat, like red meat and shellfish, but also in lentils and pumpkin seeds. And so I typically prescribe zinc the way I prescribe iron in something called pulse doses. So I'll recommend people work their way through a bottle of zinc, taking 30 to 100 milligrams a day, um, while we assess whether symptoms improve. Unlike iron, which we can measure more accurately by looking at its storage molecule, ferritin, zinc can't be accu accurately measured in blood. So it's more like magnesium. So like magnesium, zinc deficiency in the body's tissues may be present long before low zinc levels show up in the blood. Um, and it's important to take zinc supplements with food because it can cause nausea on an empty stomach. And so that's it. So while this list can be a great tool for anyone interested in supporting their, their mood through boosting nutrient status, Keep in mind that this information is not a substitute for medical advice. So I believe it's essential to work with a naturopathic doctor or a functional medical doctor who can make the appropriate recommendations for your individual health needs. And a, personal, a personalized consultation that assesses your diet, blood work, health history, and specific symptoms can help you hone your list to come up with a dynamite nutrient plan that's specifically tailored to you. So thanks guys for watching. I'm gonna post some links below the video and I'll post the transcript as well. And take care.